Okay, kann... Ah, ja. Und hallo allen, wollte besonders die Claudia von Wikimedia danken, um für mich hier zu haben. Ähm, mein Deutsch ist okay, aber ich werde weiter auf Englisch äh, vortragen, weil mein Vortrag Deutsch ist nicht so gut, noch nicht. <lacht> so, um, thank you all for being here and for listening to my story. What I hope to achieve today is to inspire you, no matter whether you're a software developer, uh, a physics engineer, or an artist, or whatever you are, uh, to go out there and learn so much from teaching others. Of course, there is a big benefit for teaching others, for them, of course, but for you, there's also a lot to be gained. So, you might be wondering uh, who I am and why my hair looks nothing like it does in the picture. And that's because this picture is not actually me, but it's actually me from seven years ago. You see, um, seven years ago I started out, I had been uh, developing software for a few years. So this is Ramon from uh, seven years ago. Uh, say hi to the nice people, please, Ramon. Yes, and... Uh, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? You'll have to forgive him. He's a little shy. But he's happy. He's been uh, doing uh, uh, developing Mac software for a few years, as well as uh, Ruby, which is a programming language. He's been doing that for a few years. And he's been really enjoying it. And he started get to get a little bit enthusiastic towards getting out there, meeting people who do the same. He's always worked from home, you see, to this day, some say. Um, uh, and he, he really enjoyed it, but he started getting this itch. He started hearing about meetups and uh, coaching and uh, boot camps, Rails Girls, all of these initiatives. And he thought, okay, I got to get out there. And so seven years ago, this gentleman went to a meetup that was actually held here in Metalab. I cannot for the life of me remember what that meetup was. It was in German, and I was very... as displayed in this picture, very, very shy. And uh, I just got so intimidated that I went back home into my hobbit hole and never came out again. <laughs> but um, so interestingly, I still had this itch and I thought, wow, well, what could I do? Where do I feel comfortable? So um, what happened after that, I went to my old high school and I said, hey, um, could I do an after-school activity here? And they said, yeah, of course. And so my, at the time, girlfriend, now wife, started this after-school activity called computer game programming. And the Vienna International School was really nice to lend us their children to experiment on. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. And my goal was to teach them to experiment. My goal was to, my, whenever the year started, I would tell them, look, my goal is to teach you to be hackers. Right, and when I meant hackers, I told I would tell them I didn't mean the cartoonish businessman with a ski mask, right, stealing your data and your webs and your bits. No, I meant uh, to teach them to be creative. I wanted to teach them to solve problems with the with a solution that they found on their own. So, over the years, we worked with a lot of paradigms. We learned. Uh, we worked with making games. We worked with making music. Uh, using programming, and so the first year we used a, uh, a, f a game creation framework called Gosu, right? Don't know if you've heard of it. It's in, C I know it's in Ruby, I know it's in C++, I know it's in other, I believe it's imported to other languages as well. It's good fun, do check it out. Um, and in my infinite 22-year-old wisdom, I thought, well, why make research when I can just dive in head first and think, I, I can teach, no problem. And, <laughs> you know, I, it, I did a, I, I'm very happy with the job I did, but of course there were a lot of challenges. For example, uh, we would meet once a week. Um, in case you're curious, this is between uh, 10 and 11 year olds, right? And um, we would meet once a week after school. At that time, you know, it's school's over, they're tired. I have to compete with English, with math, with physics, with biology, German, French, and all these other languages. And I thought, okay, that's, you know, I have to keep it active. I have to keep it energetic. And of course, you know, it being an after-school activity, you might wonder, could I give them homework? No, 
<laughs> so that wasn't going to happen. And so the way these after-school activities worked was that uh, halfway through the year at the semester change, the students had the opportunity to either stay with our activity or move to a different one. So from moving from the winter to the summer semester, what would happen is that sometimes the kids would drop the activity, go do a sport outside, which is fantastic, or they would go, they would go somewhere else, or they just said, you know what, I don't like this. And towards the beginning of doing this, it just, it was, every time a kid quit, it was like a defeat. It was like I had failed them. And what I realized over time was that, and, and seeing these kids grow up, is that maybe I didn't, you know, get them to be programmers like me, but I did plant a seed of curiosity in them that someday will bloom and become either a skill that they can use at work, some automation, maybe understanding better how to communicate with programmers who I'm told are difficult to talk to. <laughs> um, and so, well, what I did was after many years of doing this, I broke all of the things that I learned from teaching children to code that taught me something into five areas, which I'm going to go over now. Uh, we're going to start with the, uh, the importance of having fun. We're going to learn to appreciate the things that I take for granted as a programmer, as well uh, as the importance of practice, simplicity, and ease of understanding, not being entirely related. And how good it is for a developer to show and read code. So let me paint you a, a picture. So we're making a, a little two-dimensional two game where you are a spaceship flying through space. You're avoiding your asteroids, right? And the kids would ask me, Ramon, um, what, what speed, what, which speed should they move at? And so I would say, you know, something like, you know, 10, a speed of 10 units per second, uh, 15 units. And then they would come out and say, this game is impossible. I'm putting it way too high and it doesn't work. So I'll give you another example. Maybe we're making a jump and run game where you hop around and beat enemies. And they would ask me, Ramon, how many enemies should I put on the screen? And I'd say, uh, well, maybe four, maybe five. Five is good. And in my head, having learned my lesson from the spaceship game, I thought, yeah, they're going to put in 10. But I was wrong. It was more something like, oh, no, don't, don't fail me now. Uh, one second, I'm sorry. I'm spoiling all the fun parts. <laughs> well, okay, before this PDF viewer crashes, let's just say that there were thousands of enemies. And in the example you see here, what would happen is they would ask me how high they would jump, and, well, you get the idea now. And at the beginning, this kind of used to stress me out because the, I'm, I'm kind of thinking like, you're not making anything. I, I had the stress of giving these kids every week something that they could show, go home and show their family and friends, right? But they would just break things, they would make messes, and I would think, gosh, I must be doing an awful job if they're just going around and breaking things. But again, over time, I, I thought about it properly, and I came to the conclusion that this is how I program. I program by breaking things. It's so important to just, you know, Get it, jump into an, a problem, play around, and come up with a solution. And then what was remarkable is that the kids started talking to each other, going like, what's going on with my game? And they'd be like, yeah, I, you, maybe you shouldn't put 9,000 enemies on the screen at once. This aspect of fun is sometimes something that I forget about. Uh, you know, just going around, trying things out. If it breaks, that's fine. I understand a little bit better. So that's the lesson I took away from that. Next up... Um, Quick warning, I'm going to show a tiny bit of code, but it's nothing that uh, shouldn't be a explainable on the go. So um, I would show the kids this piece of code. This is Ruby, by the way, where we would declare a variable called Anna, and then we would call puts, which is to print uh, that ver the value of that variable. And I would tell them, OK, kids, what happens? And they would say, yes, well, it prints Anna. And I would say, that's right. And then just to make sure that they understood correctly, I said, OK, now look at this code, where it prints the, the value of the variable, and then it declares a variable. And they, I asked them, what happens? And they said, well, the same thing. It prints out the name. And I said, well, 
that's wrong because what happens is you get an error saying that name, the variable name doesn't have an object. And I kind of use this as a segue to start explaining to them that code most of the time is like a book. You go line by line from start to finish. And I always encourage these kids to interrupt me uh, if if there's, they have questions or there's something they don't understand. Most of the time, it, they, they would just argue with me and say, hey, hey, but hold on. Have you ever heard of choose your own adventure books? The whole point of a cho choose your own adventure book is that you get to decide which page you, page you go to and when. Why doesn't this work with code? This is something that I had completely taken for granted. Next up, um, after making a few games that are mostly centered around the command line, the terminal, I, I, I would always be excited to show them, now we make the shiny graphics, now we do the fun stuff. Here's a window for the super game, and the way you draw your character on the screen is by giving it coordinates. An X value describing where it is along the horizontal axis, and the Y value saying where it goes along the uh, vertical axis. And so I would tell them, so to move your character up and down, you just increase the, and uh, decrease these values. And I would tell them, so if you want to have it, if, if you put both values at zero, it goes to the top left. And again, one of the kids interrupts me and say, hold on, hold on. I learned in math, when you do graphs, it's at the bottom left. What's going on here? Why are you computer programmers making this so different for the sake of being different? And frankly, I had no idea. Like, I, I never wondered this. I, I just, you know, when I started programming and they told me this, I was just like, okay, fine. That so seems about right. But um, again, I didn't know what to tell them. So I had to go home and look this up. Now, in case you're curious why, I learned that what happens is that you see old monitors which uh, are CRTs, cathode ray tubes, they would render images by, go by drawing from left to right, top to bottom, line by line. In that case, it makes sense to have the origin, that is both values being zero, in the top left. Um, in if you want to see that in action, by the way, there's a video on YouTube where someone's playing Super Mario Brothers like on a 20,000 frames per second camera, and you can see it like draw line by line, it is mesmerizing. I highly recommend it. And it's this sort of thing that I think I can take away and say, I need to be curious like I used to be when I was a child. Now, let's talk a little bit about practice. It's something that uh, <laughs> I wish I was better at. I'll give you a story. So I would be teaching a concept to children. I would tell them, okay, this is this new concept. Uh, this is how it works. This is how you add things to an array or a list of objects. This is how you remove things. This is how you iterate over all the objects in a list and make changes to them. So now that I've taught you these basics, go use them. And they had no idea what to do with that. Why? Because they hadn't seen it really in action yet. So what I did instead later on was when I introduced new topics, I would actually introduce little exercises. I would say, okay, who can tell me how to make a new list with 50 enemies or how to add an enemy or remove it or move it five pixels or kill all of them? And at first they were just like, come on, I just want to make my explosions. And uh, <laughs> what actually happened over time is they be started becoming competitive. And it was fantastic. They would, before I could even finish asking the question, they'd be like, no, 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 pick me. I know, I know, I know. And it reminded me of me. I, when I don't know how to do something, I have to practice to eventually get better. I still can't draw, by the way. These are not my drawings. <laughs> so uh, next up is how the shortcuts we take as software developers or the or the what we consider clean code can sometimes not seem like clean code to someone else so i got a little bit more code coming up um so here's an update uh method in ruby which what it does is it takes the ca main character's x coordinate and increases it by five the objective is to make the character move five pixels to the right yeah I showed this to the kids and they said, yeah, this, this looks good. And then, and then I thought, all right, get ready, kids. I'm going to blow your socks off. Here's a much better way to do it. Doesn't that look nice, I said. And the kid told me, uh, nah, 
I liked it more the other way. And I thought, well, that's just well, that one kid. I'll ask the rest of the group, gang, what do you think? And they'd go, yeah, we like it the other way more too, which baffled me. I, how can you take something that's, that's so short and so nice and turn it into something more verbose? Well, I mean, when you're new to something, you forget that what real, the best way to write a piece of code is to make it not only simple, but also easy to understand for people coming to look at your code. So even though you might have something like this, which I think is beautiful Ruby, what this is doing is it moves the character five pixels to the left. But if, if that X coordinate becomes less than zero, then it'll stick it to the left side of the screen. Does that make sense? Right. And so sometimes verbosity actually becomes simplicity. And by taking this piece of code up the, at the top and turning it into the piece of code at the bottom, which one um, better describes what I described to you? The piece of the bottom. It's important, I think, to really try and communicate what your code is trying to say. So my last point for today is how showing and reading code is important. Now, picture this, right? Uh, every week I get one hour with the kids and, um, you know, towards the latter end of the, of the session, you know, I'm getting really stressed because so many games are broken and they're all like, oh, I need help, I need help. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, give me a second. And, you know, and then I would be in, in a hurry and I'd be stressed and they'd say like, hey, listen, could you just fix it for me? I get an error. And I'd be like, oh, you know, I could see the error and I'd be like, well, maybe you look, um, somewhere there, and, uh, and they'd be like, come on, I have no idea what to do, I'm stuck. And so I'd be like, okay, I'll just fix it for you one time. And what happened? Over a few weeks of doing this, instead of saying, hey, you know, can you please help me, they'd just be like, it's broken, I don't know. What happened? Did I create a generation of lazy people? No, what happened was I was giving, I was, you know, giving, instilling, I don't know if that's a word, uh, bad habits. And so what I did instead was when they would show me a piece of code, please pay no mind to what this piece of code is. Um, when, I, when they would show me something like this, where there is an end missing at the bottom, what I would instead do is have one of the other kids who was faster or more finished, uh, more finished, uh, who was finished for the day, at that point I told them, hey, um, why don't you go ask um, Amy over there? Could, maybe she could f help you. And so Amy would come over. She would find the missing end. And that was that. But what happened was when I started doing that, they wouldn't come to me anymore. They would go to each other and ask each other for help. Even sometimes they would take their chair, move, plop it in front of their computer, and really sit down with them. And I discovered pair programming happened, like out of nowhere. In case you don't know, pair programming is where you have two people working at one computer, one person uh, does the coding, the other one you know, um, follows along and gives suggestions. And this just happened naturally. It, I was floored by this. As a result, not just the kids, but me, by watching the kids go, I'm reading their code. And of course, pair programming is pretty sweet. Um, so listen, this was just a few of the things I learned. You might be wondering, so what about the kids themselves? Where are they now? So, you know, I, I, I had done this for seven years and this, you know, when they're about, uh, um, 11 or 12 or t uh, 10 or 11, they, a lot of, a lot of those kids are now graduated. Uh, and a couple of them have gone into university to learn to program. Some of them have become game, game developers. Others of them stopped coding, but still, you know, send me exercises, programming exercises that they're stuck on, or they send me their website. They're like, check it out. I made my own website. They even continued making games for the school for their, um, for their initiatives. Like there was a, uh, there was an eco, uh, biodegradable, drive last year something for 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 you know the environment and one of them made a game about picking up going around picking up trash and it got like i think i think it was last year the year before but president van der bellen go, went to see it it was it was amazing I, I wasn't even there i wasn't even involved but 
you know, it, it, it really touched me how, you know, because this is an age, you know, the, the, the kids I got, in case you're curious, were not just boys. We had a really diverse set of kids. We had uh, ki not only kids from all around the world, but, you know, one of my favorite examples of a game one of the girls made was uh, a ferret. You, are, you play as a ferret from space, defending Earth from evil lobsters. I wish I had a screenshot of it, but I don't. And myself, I picked up so much confidence and comfort with myself in that. Over the years, what happened? Well, uh, after I'd been doing this for a time, I finally put on my backpack, I kicked back the tears, and I went to my first ever meetup at Sector 5, now defunct, rest in peace, Sector 5. Um, I started coaching at events, I went to a lot of Rails Girls, uh, workshops, which are super fun, and even if you're not experienced in Rails, or not very experienced, but still know a bit about it, I highly recommend you go because you learn so much from coaching, much more than you do, I think. Well, okay, it's s subjective. Um, you learn so much from coaching, and I've continued doing that for years now, and it's, I love it. Um, I'm even here today giving a presentation to you, which again, I would have never done at that time. And I made so many friends and I've become so much more open about, you know, how I became a programmer. And so what I want to tell you is to, you know, teach anyone, no matter what it is, no matter who you are, everybody can learn from you and you can learn from teaching them. So with that, I'll thank my wife, Birgit, and my sister, Pilar, for doing those lovely illustrations. And uh, thank you for having me. Uh, we can do questions in German, by the way. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Beautiful speech. Thank Thanks you. a lot. So, wer hat Fragen? Kommentare? They are overwhelmed. <laughs> so are you still teaching at this school or at another school? And are you um, teaching uh, adults? Uh, yeah, well, I'm still, I'm still working with the kids at the school. Um, I'm actually meeting one of them tomorrow to help them with some 3D stuff, which I'm not very experienced in, but I'm sure we can t learn from an one another. Uh, do I teach adults? Not professionally, but I do a lot of, I, I go to a lot of workshops where I coach and help them do whatever they like. Oh, and uh, I will, up, un up until January, my sister and I were running a weekly study group called Ruby Habits over at the Wikimedia office. Um, and we're about to start doing that again under a different name, Study Jams, because Ruby's not that popular anymore. Uh, so yeah, so if you have, so I do, I spend a lot of time there, like introducing uh, people to programming or helping people become motivated to give talks at conferences and stuff like that. It's all. So do I still do it? Yes. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. No fragen. Um, was ein Pisto für kleinere Kinder, so weiß nicht, sechs bis zehn. Sechs bis zehn. Okay, ich habe nie vorher mit diesem äh, Junge, aber äh, mit diesem Alter, mit diesem Alter äh, gearbeitet. Aber es gibt ein paar, also ich würde empfehlen, für so ein junges Kind nicht Programmieren ganz schriftlich zu tun, sondern die Konzepte von Logik zu lernen. Zum Beispiel gibt es dieses gratis Spiel called Lightbot, I think. Lightbot? Ja. Yeah wo man programmiert, ein, ein Robot äh, von Punkt A nach B zu bringen. Es ist sehr toll. Äh, für Jüngere hat der Stefan mich diese, wie heißt das, Code a Pillar? Code a Pillar gezeigt. Und ich habe es ganz toll gefunden. Es ist ein, wie sagt man Code a Pillar auf Deutsch? Äh, Raupe. Ein programmierbarer Raup, 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 Raupe. <lacht> und es ist ganz toll, weil ähm, man, man ähm, äh, bildet, äh, nein, nicht bildet, ähm, äh, sorry, <lacht> I'm a bit more nervous than I thought. Uh, you build its body, see each part of, uh, see, you can see here, each part of its body is an instruction. 
And with them, you can teach them, you know, procedural logic as well. So I think uh, for children, uh, I think what's most important, more than syntax of programming or more than, uh, like I said, uh, it's, it's logic. I think that's really important to learn, like how procedures and how you can loop over stuff like this. I think Lightbot introduces functions as well. Um, this to me is really important, as well, of course, as instant gratification. <laughs> so maybe not start with a with a with a you know giant Java project, uh, but inst <laughs> where you spend half an hour installing. Uh, I don't even know what the IDE is called anymore. Um, <laughs> but instead, you know, do do something smaller. And, and like I said, for example, Aha Sonic Pi. I don't know if you've heard of this. This is one of my favorite programs in the world because this is programmable music. Um, so if you want to say, I don't know if there's a demo here. Uh, there's a few YouTube videos, but I'm not gonna explode your ears with that. Ah, okay, here we go. So you can play a sample by, you can have a loop that sample that plays a sample and it tells it how long to sleep. But you can also just choose an instrument, you know, choose instrument piano, Play C, and it'll play the key, uh, the the note C. Uh, this is really cool. Uh, if you do work with children, I advise you to have them wear headphones, if, for your sanity's sake. <laughs> yeah, I hope that answers your question. Thanks a lot. <laughs>